Um, welcome to our online forum uh, presented by Communities Confronting Substance Abuse and Rifa Enu. We're very pleased to introduce uh, Rabbi Rothwax, Dr. Rossman, and Arnie. Why did I just lose your last name, Arnie? I go go fine. fine. Go fine. Yes, I apologize. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And with that, I'm going to correct it and make a better intro. Arnie Goldfein has been in the Jewish recovery world for close to 35 years and is in a unique position to understand the feelings of stigma, hopelessness, remorse, shame, guilt, and fear associated with substance use disorder. He has served as president of JACS, Jewish Alcoholics Chemically Dependent Person and Significant Others, a program of the Jewish Board of Families and Children's Services for over seven years, and subsequently is co-executive director of Rodfei Shalom Inc. Both organizations are dedicated to the recovery of people with substance use issues. As a New York State certified peer advocate recovery specialist, he has helped hundreds of people to get their lives back on track to live a long-term self-sustained healthy life. Rabbi Rothwax has served as Rabbi at Congregation Beth Aaron in Teaneck, New Jersey since August 2002. Rabbi Rothwax is a graduate of Yeshiva College, the Azraeli School of Jewish Education, and received his smicha from the Rabbi Yitzhak Elchanan Theological Seminary. From 1998 through 2016, Rabbi Rothwax taught Talmud at Yeshiva University High School for Boys and the Rosenbaum Yeshiva of New Jersey, and he currently serves as head rabbi of Camp Morashat. In 2016, he was appointed director of professional rabbinics at REITs at YU. And Dr. Rossman is a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in the treatment of issues related to addiction, trauma, and self-esteem. Since 2008, he has worked at the VA Hudson Valley HCS in Montrose, New York, serving as staff psychologist on the hospital's residential substance abuse and PTSD units. He also has a private practice in Teaneck, New Jersey, enjoys writing articles about mental health and likes free building Lego sculptures. And with that, Rabbi, why don't Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure, a uh, personal honor uh, to have the opportunity to present uh, to you uh, together uh, with uh, my very uh, accomplished and esteemed colleagues. Uh, I think it goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, to cover a topic like this, to properly address it in 40 minutes uh, is, is not close to impossible. It is impossible, uh, but I can say now, 45 minutes later than, um, than, than the beginning of the first session, um, you know, we, we can have a meaningful conversation and I hope uh, to be able to do so. Uh, we had a brief discussion last week as to how uh, to conduct this session. Uh, Dr. Russman had a, I, I think a very clever uh, suggestion which worked and we're going to do it again right now and that is that rather than sort of discuss the issue of alcohol and Jewish ritual in, in the abstract and just try to sort of talk about it conceptually to zero in and focus on a particular scenario that we can all imagine and relate to using that as sort of a case study uh, through which uh, we can you know, discuss the, the connection and some of the challenges and the conflicts that we feel as perhaps as individuals, but certainly as a community uh, when trying to reconcile some of the realities um, facing individuals who struggle with, with alcohol. And on the other hand, at least our perception of what the Jewish ritual is and, and the demands uh, that, that it has of us. So we're going to talk about a Shalom Zachar. Uh, we're not going to talk about any, any particular family or case, but you can just close your eyes, if you will, and just imagine the last Shalom Zachar that you attended. And in all likelihood, there was uh, alcohol and very possible there was an abundance of alcohol, uh, which means in terms of the quantity as well as the quality. I happen not to be, you know, a maven when it comes to alcohol, but I can usually tell just, you know, you can tell the difference between a, a bottle of Rashi wine um, and, and a bottle of scotch. Um, and usually you can tell by the, the numbers of the bottles and the way that people who really know, the Mavinim know, and they, I don't mean salivate, I don't, I don't mean it in a, in, a, in a cynical, dismissive way. Uh, and perhaps not literal, but there is a certain there is a certain attitude um, and, and a delight that individuals who are not necessarily uh, sh struggling with alcoholism, but but they really really appreciate you know a, a good crush of expensive bottle of scotch. And often the Shalom Zachar is a is a venue 
it is a it is a moment in which this this sort of um, this this happens, and and so therefore, as a rabbi, I guess the question is, you know, wh what's my reaction to that? How do I feel about that? Is that something that makes me comfortable? Is this something that I would recommend? Is this something that I would prohibit? Um, and the answer is, you know, I, I you know I, ca I can't answer any of those questions in the most absolute term right now. But there are, there are a few I would say guidelines, and there's some important objectives that I think need to be uh, met at all times. Uh, first of all, we must recognize that there are individuals in our community who have certain vulnerabilities and, and, and struggles uh, in general, but particularly as it relates to what we're discussing right now um, around uh, the usage and consumption of alcohol. Um, and maybe, maybe when we are in, in, a, in our own home, you know, surrounded by the members of our immediate family, and we really know the members of our family well, so perhaps we can discuss this question in a vacuum, but once we step outside of our home, once we invite anybody else into our home, and Shalom Zacher is a perfect example, we are now in a communal setting. So we have to understand and appreciate that many individuals who struggle with alcohol, um, unfortunately, these problems um, first were, were first generated and evolve in and through community connections. And so therefore we need to be mindful of that. And it doesn't make a difference whether or not you know that anybody who is sitting next to you at that particular moment has a history of struggle, you have to assume that they do. Statistically speaking, uh, if there are 20, 30 people in the room, then there are at least a handful. Um, and it makes no difference that they're members of the Orthodox community. We are in no way whatsoever immune to this, quite to the contrary. The second point I would make is that, um, you know, in halacha, we have a concept of ikor and tafel. It comes up in different areas of halacha, hilchus brachos, but that's not the only one. And that is that we look at what is primary and what is secondary. When it comes to alcohol at any event, I would say Shalom Zacher, but I would also include other events in which the use of alcohol is something which is not just recommended, it is something which, you know, is, is, is appropriate. You know, Kiddush, Abdallah, certainly Purim, uh, Pesach, um, you know, moments like this in which we traditionally include and incorporate alcohol, it is never supposed to be the ikar. It is never supposed to be the primary feature, and especially at Shalom Zacher. Which in and of itself, Shalom Zacher, there's no no chiv to have a Shalom Zacher. It's not an obligation to attend one, so we have to keep that in mind. But but when we're sitting there and you see that alcohol is sort of the centerpiece of that moment, it is glorified, which is a word that I use and I've sometimes been called out on it by people who say that that's my subjective perspective. But okay, um, that's what I sometimes see. That's how I see it. A glorification of alcohol. That's inappropriate. That's something that I think we need to be mindful of and call ourselves out as a community. Um, I would also say, without getting into the particulars right now, that um, again, I'm, I'm speaking as a rabbi, not as a mental health professional, not anybody who has any you know, special um, qualifications to speak about alcohol, but as somebody who has some qualifications to speak about halacha and minhag, there are differences between halacha and minhag in general, and particularly as it relates to this issue. A person who says that it is halachically required, it is an obligation to go ahead and to drink, get drunk on Purim, in my opinion, is... Is, is ignorant. That is not a true statement. The person says that it is, you cannot be Yotzi, the mitzvah of Kiddush, without alcohol. That is, that is an, it's, it may be a well-meaning statement, but the person is, is ignorant um, in, in regard to this particular halacha. Um, so there are difference between halachos and ritual. There's a difference between ritual and culture. You know, I, I think that the, the presence of alcohol and, and the abundance that it appears as a Shalom Zacher is much more of a cultural reality than it is even a ritual one certainly not a halachic one, as I already mentioned. And there are differences between true cultures, you know, a history, which goes back perhaps a generation or two or several, and unhealthy and dangerous behaviors and habits that are now forming, particularly in our uh, society uh, today. I'll conclude my remarks with one practical suggestion, but it's an important, important one, because sometimes we have these conversations and, you know, what, uh, practically, the master, what do we walk away with? So I would say that, it, in my opinion, um, if and when alcohol is being served at any event, but um, we're talking about Hashem Zacher right now, probably best not to offer anybody a drink, but never offer anybody a drink twice. And I've seen with my own eyes individuals who really should not, cannot have a drink, literally their life depends on it. And other people, well-meaning, really with the best of intentions, will say, would you like? No, thank you. Come on, have a little, just a little. Not realizing that that little, as Arnie will speak about you know, in a moment, you know, could be literally, you know, a gateway to hell for this person. And so therefore to understand and to appreciate with the greatest of sensitivity that there are struggles that people have that we perhaps cannot relate to, 
um, and to be as sensitive as we can in general, but particularly in moments like this, to you know assume uh, sort of assume the worst and, and and be as as careful as we can not to put put somebody in a situation where where we are you know uh, pressuring them to to indulge in a way that would be very harmful to them. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come up for air and pass the floor over to Zaki, Dr. Rossman. Thank you, Rabbi Rothwax. You know, it's interesting doing a session after doing it previous because it gave me some time to kind of conceptualize different things that maybe we missed or didn't highlight as much, you know, last time that I would like to address on, you know, on this meeting. And it was interesting, again, what you mentioned about the Iker and Tafel, really the primacy oftentimes that alcohol sometimes plays I would say during Jewish ritual, as opposed to as part of Jewish ritual, because I think, as you mentioned, a lot of it is, if you will, self-imposed, right? The people participating in the ritual choose to elevate alcohol to this is why we're all getting together, as opposed to thinking about, well, what is the religious reason or the Jewish ritual reason that we're getting together? And I think that oftentimes is, in my mind, one of the most problematic issues is the idea that the ritual, the religious part gets lost because of the great emphasis that some people place on alcohol that's being served. And while we're talking about a Shalom Zahar, I would be remiss to not expand the horizon to anything related to Judaism that people are, or any time related to Judaism that people are involving alcohol. So whether it be some Kastora, whether it be Purim, whether it be Kiddush, whether it be at a Shabbos meal where you already made Kiddush, so the religious, the Jewish piece, the halachic piece is done, but now all of a sudden, okay, well, Kiddush is over. Now let me bring out my entire liquor cabinet to show everyone you know, what I have is that I value and lamented you know, on a personal level how sometimes I'll be at a meal and there's more time spent on the different or analyzing the different bottles of liquor or wine than it is talking about, let's say, the Parsha or Yantiv or Shabbos. So that's just something that I would um, begin with. The other point is that this is a very poignant topic for the time period that we find ourselves, you know, especially during the pandemic. There was a recent study that was put out that said, as compared to this time last year, alcohol use in the United States is up 14%. In certain segments of the population, that number goes up to 19%. And what I would, I guess what I'm concerned about is within the context of one's own home, if alcohol use is increasing, then my concern is when the society opens or when gatherings are happening again. And again, the social elements of alcohol use was present, you know, what that will mean for the people who might now have a stronger, more intimate relationship, if you will, you know, with alcohol as a result of the pandemic. Also, another number that really strikes a chord for me is that they ask people what the impact, the negative impact that alcohol has had on them, you know, in the past year. And there is an increase for women of 39% more problems as a result to their alcohol intake. And for men, 27 greater negative impact of their alcohol use. And that's just a unbelievable number. And I think it, what it speaks to is that oftentimes alcohol is more than just, you know, something that one does, but it serves a purpose. And we mentioned this you know, in our last session is that as a substance, alcohol is addictive on a physiological level. Ecological level, it also oftentimes serves a purpose. It, helps one deal with their emotions oftentimes if someone is anxious or depressed or is uncomfortable engaging other people you know one of my clients refers to alcohol as uh, liquid courage you know if i'm nervous well if i drink then all of a sudden i'm the life of the party i don't have to worry about anything and i would imagine even during the pandemic many people being stressed being cooped up at home you know whatever it is alcohol provides that avenue to at least feel better. And that in and of itself is concerning because while alcohol helps you feel better, maybe while you're drinking, 
the second the effects of wear off, you're right back where you started. So you're not actually gaining any healthy coping skills in terms of how to manage your mental health issues or manage the stresses in your life. You're simply putting a Band-Aid on it. The Band-Aid gets peeled off. That becomes, um, those issues oftentimes are actually more prominent than they were when they first started. So those are things that we resonated the other piece that I would say is as I, you know, walk into a Shalom Zachar is I reflect back to when I first started working in the addiction field in a substance abuse rehab. And there was a Friday night that I went to a Shalom Zachar. And I remember thinking to myself, five hours ago, I was talking to an individual about the ravaging effects that alcohol had on his life in terms of his marriage, in terms of his finances, his legal issues, in terms of his health. You know, and you were talking about ways of avoiding alcohol use and how to manage, you know, relapse triggers. And then I walk into Shalom Zachar and the very substances that when I was talking to the individual in rehab were so taboo and so scary and dangerous, which it is. There's a whole smorgasbord of exactly those substances, you know, out on the table for everyone to partake in and people partaking at a level that again, based on health guidelines, is not a healthy level of engagement. And for me, what it really struck a chord for was that here's something that is potentially very dangerous, and yet no one seems to be aware of it. No one's cognizant of it. And that oftentimes is a concern for me. And I've always thought about it more in terms of what is one's relationship with alcohol than whether or not they meet criteria for alcohol use disorder. You know, does your relationship with alcohol take primacy, significant relationships in your life? Thinking back to the, you know, pandemic, the, I think at the end of March or April, alcohol sales in the United States were up 54%. So here's a period of time where there's a lot of stress in terms of people being laid off, people needing, you know, loans, a lot of financial issues, and yet people are spending 54% more People are spending money, if you will, on alcohol, which last I checked is not free, right? And how do you, how do you work those together? And what that represents is that for those people at that time, their relationship with alcohol was more important, if you will, than their financial stability. Now, I would venture to guess no one's thinking about it that way. And there's no question that people probably aren't. But as we reflect backwards, I think sometimes that becomes an important thing to notice. And it's the same with regard to family relationships. I, am I leaving my Friday night dinner, right? leaving my wife and my kids, you know, high and dry, so to speak? I got to cut it short because I got to get to the Shalom Zucker on time, right? Now, if you're going because you want to celebrate with the father and the Shalom Zucker means a lot to you, okay. If you're going because I got to get there before they finish the, you know, 30 year bottle of whatever, then what you're really highlighting is that my relationship with alcohol is more important than my relationship with my kids or my wife. And that's something that I oftentimes encourage people to reflect upon. It's not about do I have a problem or not? It's about quality, right? Is my, the quality of my relationships otherwise in my life, whether it be financial, whether it be health wise, whether it be, you know, legal, et cetera, are those relationships more important to me than my relationship with alcohol? Or do I sometimes engage in my relationship with alcohol to the detriment of some of those other significant relationships? And that becomes something that I think is important. And just to finally add, the biggest concern that I've always felt, you know, at Ashlam Zakhar, or any you know, Jewish um, or any religious experience where alcohol is served is what are we showing our kids? You know, there are little kids that are running around the tables getting, you know, candies and taking cakes and things like that. And what are they seeing by way of our interactions with, you know, alcohol? Are they noticing that alcohol is dangerous or is the message that they're taking, hey, you know what, this is something that no problem, you know, whenever I get either old enough or whenever someone offers me, then I'll take it just like I'll take the gummy bears that are on the you know tray over there. And that oftentimes is something that I'm curious about and not frankly very worried about is what are we showing our kids by our, to some extent, flippant interaction with alcohol. So those are just some 
ideas off the top of my head in terms of when I you know, into situations like that. Hey, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's great to be back. <laughs> it's only been 15 minutes. Um, you know, you guys got me thinking. Uh, also, uh, thank you, uh, Safi. Um, and when I was growing up, um, my bar mitzvah, very interestingly, my bar mitzvah parsha is Noah. So <laughs> anybody who knows parsha is Noah, everybody, the boys who laugh, and you know, Noah, Noah was the first, you know, what did he do when he came out of the Teva? He went and he built the vineyard and all the ramifications and he got drunk and all the stuff that went with it. So maybe it was an indication of what my life uh, ended up being. And it was really, um, we talked about this before and, you know, just to mention that, you know, I was 11 years old. Uh, I was in shul and Shabbos morning, and and one of the old men called me called me over and says, "Kimeran, kimeran, nem teshtik herring with a glass of schnapps." You know, take a piece of herring with a with a glass of schnapps, and you know the herring was bad enough. Let me tell you, at eleven years old, but um, four things happened to me that day, and and the first one was I hated the way it smelled, I hated the way it tasted, I, and, and, and I loved in one millionth of a second what it what it made how it made me feel, and then. Then there was that fourth thing that, that stayed with me for, I don't know how many years, I wanted more. And that's indicative of what, you know, where addiction is or, 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 or how, what's going on inside of my system. And um, in my life, I've identified that there's seven areas of my life that I cannot separate. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, social, and sexual. And um, all these things are involved with this stuff. You know, um, uh, uh, Dr. Rossman mentioned before, you know, like I, I would pick up a drink and, you know, I got taller, I got better looking, I was able to talk to women, I, I could dance, I could do all kind of stuff that I couldn't do. Forget halacha here, guys. <laughs> I'm talking about halacha. But, you know, the stuff that everybody was doing and I, I needed to do. And I think what we need to begin to do is, is, is differentiate between what's addictive drinking um, what substance use disorder, uh, which only really affects, not, I shouldn't say only really, not mm -hmm. only, it's not the right word I, I, I want to use, uh, that affects probably 10 to 15% of the population versus people who are heavy duty drinkers. You know, I, you know, there were guys who I used to use, who I used to drink with, um, that, that when they had sufficient reason, when the doctor said to them, um, okay, your liver is, uh, in, in, you know, uh, swollen, or the boss said to them, you're going to lose your job. They had sufficient reason to stop, and they stopped. Um, I wasn't that guy. I wasn't that guy. I was the guy that even with all the emotional pleading of friends and neighbors and family that, you know, what about your family? And what about your kids? And what about everything? You know, in that moment, I would say, yeah, I gotcha. Um, and I would swear that I wouldn't pick it up. And if you put me on a lie detector test in that moment, I wouldn't, I would never pick it up until 10 minutes later when the next guy came by and offered me something and I was off to the races again. So it's not so much about, about, you know, what's, what's, what was really not going on with me is what was going on with me. And I happen to have been that guy that if I picked up a drink, uh, when the dose wore off, um, it was worse. And, and I've seen, I've seen a really linear, uh, graph on this that, that, you know, if our, if our point is zero and we take a drink and it takes us up to one, when it drops us down, it takes us below the zero point. And I always have to catch up. I'm always running to catch up and I, I'll never make it. So, so what's really going on here and what are we doing and what are we doing, you know, with the individual who has a problem what's, versus the culture that has, that might have a problem versus, you know, like who's got the best bottle. And incidentally, I went, I was at one of my son's in laws houses and I don't even see alcohol anymore, by the way. Um, <laughs> he's got a bottle. He's got this gorgeous bottle. I mean, etched bottle and everything. And I, I walked over and picked it up and my daughter said to me, she says, Abba, what are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? She says, that's vodka. I didn't even realize. I mean, you know, they've, they've, they've glamorized this so much, you know, that, that it's so, you know, um, ensnaring that we don't even realize half the time what's going on. I think what we need to begin to do, and it's very hard because if somebody, if somebody does have an alcohol problem, they're going to, their, their defiance and their rebellion will, will defend the fact that they don't have a problem. 
And it's the only disease that I know of that, that tells us we don't have a disease. Um, for those who, you know, that's, that's my perspective of, of alcoholism. And our need to really identify the fact is what, what are we doing as a culture and what are we doing as a, as a religion? Um, what are we really, you know, what's the real, you, uh, the real reasoning behind going to Shalom Zuffer or Simcha Stover and stuff that we're losing out, that we're finding in the bottom of a bottle instead of what the spiritual um, uh, experience um, is supposed to be. And I think the more that we begin to examine that and examine it from a from a healthier, I'm going to use the term spiritual, you know, viewpoint, the easier it's going to be for us to decide which way we're going to go and how we're going to deal with it. And not only it's how we're going to deal with it as, as adults, but as, 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 as uh, Sachi mentioned before, what are we really showing our kids? Because if the kids find the solution in the bottom of a bottle, um, instead of going to shul and davening or instead of, you know, being involved with other people and being able to give our lives away in a healthy fashion, um, we're already behind the eight ball. So I open it up to everybody. Their questions are welcome. And uh, thank you for uh, having us here. You're muted, Judy. Thank you. I just realized. Um, one of the questions that actually popped up in the earlier session that we didn't have time to address was we had been discussing modeling our behavior and in particular the, the Pesach Seder as a very difficult sort of model of what do we do. And we'd also been discussing teenagers, the rebellion. The question that came up was what is the best way to address it at the Seder, you have a late teen, teen, you know, family member at your Seder. How do you model and discuss what's truly appropriate when they're still under drinking age? Uh, I'll start that. It's a very good question. Before we get to the Pesach Seder, I just want to make a general comment. As I'm listening uh, to, to this conversation the second time around, I got a little bored and I'm just Googling a little bit, which is never a good idea. It just occurred to me something very interesting, and that is that as a community, we have completely shunned peanuts. We have eliminated peanuts from our schools, some of us from our schools, and we have sensitized the entire community that there is a significant number of, of, of people among us who have peanut allergies. Um, I didn't know how many, how many are there, actually, because I, I didn't know. So granted, you know, you can't always trust what you come up with first on your first response on Google. But according to Google, um, there are one in 200 adults in the United States that have a, um, a peanut allergy and one in 50 children, which is not an insignificant number. Um, when comparing that with the number of people who meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder, it's one in eight American adults, 12.7%. So I, I think you know, as a community, we should do a little bit of a chesed and effort over here. I'm certainly not saying that we should, you know, we should rebel and force the schools to allow us to send our kids to school with peanuts. Uh, certainly not. But if we are all sensitive and aware of the fact that there are vulnerable people among us, and even having, you know, peanuts in the room is something that could be potentially uh, harmful, maybe even worst case scenario, life threatening. Um, statistically speaking, you, you can't even compare. We have so many people among us who have an allergy, and that's really, really what it is. You know, Arnie's such a, he's such a genuine, humble guy, so he talks about his journey in a way that you almost get the impression, you know, that this is just, you know, something's, something's in his head. But the reality is, as Dr. Rossman alluded to earlier, uh, th there, there are physiological realities over here. Um, addiction in general, alcohol addiction is a, um, it's a disease, and... It, it, it's, it's an allergy that, that, you know, that one develops over the course of, of, you know, time, and we need to be sensitive to that. Now, in terms of the question of the Pesach Seder, I would just say like this. Um, first of all, you absolutely have to know who is at your table. Um, it, I don't want to go into details, not about me, but in our extended family, what we do at our Pesach Seder, uh, at our Purim Suda, has changed dramatically over the course of time, and it swings back and forth depending on who's there. And I'm talking about my own children and my nephews and my nieces. I mean, it's not always the same. It's not always the same. And that's okay. 
That's that that that's that's perfectly appropriate. So you need to know who's there at any given point. Um, in my opinion, nobody should ever be getting drunk at the Pesach Seder. So in terms of the type of wine that is consumed and who is doing the consuming and who is controlling that consuming, who's overseeing that, you know, it has to be. Um, and it's not because the danger of somebody getting drunk. Um, it's the message that is being imparted to the participants, particularly the kids. And that is that that's what Pesach is about. And Pesach Seder is not about getting drunk. It is true that Chazal preferred alcohol because it's derecheres, because yeah, it does take the edge off. And for a person who is, you know, not predisposed, that is not at risk, there's really no harm in that. Um, but to get drunk? Absolutely not. Um, somebody has to take responsibility for that, you know, from the outset. Um, in, my, in my opinion, if there's anybody at risk at the Seder, there should be no alcohol whatsoever at the Seder. Again, we can get into the finer points now right now, so how you define at risk, but if there's somebody over there who is still in the throes of of their struggle and has not gotten it under under control, it is at the very least it is insensitive, grossly insensitive, but it may be actually reckless and irresponsible. I personally feel you should be wearing masks in your, if you're in public around other people right now. That's my opinion. Um, if you if you agree that if you're if you go into the store you should be wearing a mask, you cannot reconcile that with saying you know I think you should be wearing a mask mask right now during the uh, you know during the uh, global pandemic that we're all living through. But, you know, somebody at my, else at my Pesach Seder has a problem with alcohol. It's his problem. It's not mine. Th th those, those two positions are, are, cannot be reconciled. And I would add, you know, I think when you think about addressing the issue, even talking about the decisions that we make becomes important. You know, I think, unfortunately, there's oftentimes a big stigma surrounding addiction or surrounding alcoholism. And, you know, in terms of modeling behavior, it's one thing for a parent or whoever's running the Seder to say, okay, well, we're only going to serve grape juice and just do it without ever talking about it. It's another thing to say, well, we're serving grape juice because, and not because X and Y are joining us, right? But because the emphasis that we're having, where we're having Rashi light, you know, because it's barely, it has barely any alcohol in it, because the emphasis of the Seder is we got it to is to share the story of, our freedom and to talk to our children about Pesach. And we're much clearer and we're much better able to do that when we have a clear head. And talking about alcohol in that way is not just modeling the behavior, but it's also taking away the potential stigma, which also then provides the child or the teenager the information that if at some point they start struggling with alcohol use or any other kind of addiction or any other kind of problematic behavior, this is something you could talk about. There's not what we talk about and the things that we don't talk about. We talk about everything and we're willing to talk about alcohol. We're willing to talk about, you know, any other kind of behavior that might be problematic for you or any other struggle that you might have. And I think sometimes talking through our thought processes is one of the best way to model the behavior, not just doing the behavior. Um, we're getting into a topic that, that we, again, fortunately, we don't have a lot of time to answer, but I think if it gets to a point that Pesach or any, any, any holiday comes that we're first worried about how to deal with it, it's already too late. Um, it's a problem. It's, it's really a problem. And it goes back to what are we modeling? What are we showing our kids? How do we identify the difference between potential problems or, or, or on the way to being, you know, having problems? Um, what's really, you know, addiction, what's not addiction? Um, you know, a 12% number on our population um, is a pretty high number. Uh, I grew up, uh, when I grew up in, in, in the 70s and 80s, I grew up way before the 70s and 80s, but in the 70s and 80s, um, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were studies, crazy studies, that there's no such thing as a Jewish alcoholic. I could show you the white papers on it. I still have them on my bookshelf back there. Um, and, and I went to a, I went to a therapist um, in Muncie with beer down to the middle of his chest, sitting in his big leather chair. I thought he was Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, first cousin. And he said to me, Arnie, there's no such thing as a Jewish alcoholic, but I want you to go to your doctor and go get some uh, anti-anxiety medication and sleep medication. Um, and this is from, that was a from guy, you know, this is like, like, you know, where are we, you know, we get lost between, you know, between the cracks of us being lost. 
So if we get to the point that Pesach comes or Purim comes or Simcha Stor or Shalom Zofra comes, and we're first asking a question, I think we're way behind the eight ball. And I think, I think the way to do this is really, uh, uh, and, and people aren't going to hear it, because if I already have a problem with, with a substance, with a substance use disorder, um, it really doesn't make a difference, and I'm going to go find a way to do it anyway. If the parents are modeling it or encouraging it, without realizing who their kids are, um, uh, they're behind the eight ball. Because if I just put down, again, we talked about this before, if I just put down the drugs and alcohol um, and my life got better, then I wouldn't have a problem. Uh, I'm a guy that I put down drugs and alcohol and my, and my life gets infinitely worse because there's too many other areas in my life that I have. Not only do I don't have skills for, but I can't cope with it. I just, I can't cope with any other stuff. And, and alcohol and drugs were my solution. Now, how do we go about doing this? And this is a whole, you know, this would probably, uh, Judy, this would be a symposium in and of itself for probably about three weeks um, on how to do this. But I think the easiest way to start this, as, as, as uh, Safi talked about, is um, let's start a conversation, guys. Let's start. A, and, and by the way, in our own family, it could be, I, listen, I got one grandkid and the same family, and I'm, I'm saving a seat for him anytime he's ready for it. And I have another grandkid who wouldn't touch the stuff with a 10-foot pole, 20-foot pole, but a 100-foot pole. Um, so how do, we, how do we begin to do this? And it really comes from a sincere uh, honesty, from a persistence, from an understanding of, of what substance use disorder is really about. The same way, the same way if somebody got sick, God forbid, and he's in the hospital with cancer and how it affects everybody in the hospital. Listen, when my sister was sick and dying, everybody was affected. There was like 35 people that were affected and everybody had to take you know, part of this. The same way over here, we got to take a look at this because ultimately we're talking about people's, you know, life and death. Um, our kids are dying. Okay, we're dying. Forget about our kids. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not forget about our kids. I don't mean like that. We're all dying, and we really got to take a look at it. And we have to differentiate between the use and the misuse of the substance. Um, alcohol's been around for a very long time. Uh, actually, that was a thank you. That was a great lead into sort of one of the the other question that came up, which is how can we reframe our religion's seeming focus on wine as an integral part of the ritual, so that it's secondary to the actual spiritual function, of the ritual. So I hey, can, Rabbi, I'm going to give that one. Uh, so I just wanted to say one thing, and then I, I think. Uh, Rabbi Rothlax could address the, you know, the halachic, I guess, part is, I, you know, growing up, I never felt that the wine was the focus of the ritual, you know, and that was because within my family, that was never the focus, you know, and I think the very question gives you a lot of information, right? The fact that one would wonder, how do you how do you emphasize the ritual part versus the alcohol? What it says is, like Arnie was saying, you're working backwards. You're, you're muted, you're muted. Started, sorry, we've already started, you know, in a place where, in a sense, we ideally wouldn't be. Um, so that's what I would kind of offer is that when starting families, making the point to highlight the importance of the ritual of the Jewish part versus the alcohol, that starts the ball rolling, you know, in a positive direction. And I guess in this sense, I'll sort of put out a plea, especially to the women in the audience, the mothers out there, you know, they play a very strong role in shaping the way that the household is held, the what the meals look like. And I know, I think in a lot of families, the fathers tend to take over in terms of the alcohol, you know, providing that in the context of a meal, et cetera. And especially with regard to a lot of the Jewish rituals, many of them might be surrounding attendance at shul or whatever it is where there might be more male involvement in the alcohol use than the women. But I would kind of put the plea out to everyone that when setting up the family, making sure that the primacy is the Jewish and the ritual, and the alcohol is not even a close second. You know, it's sort of, a, okay, we need wine, let's say for Kiddush, so how much wine do we need? And okay, we'll do it, as opposed to making that something that's more of a focus, but I would yield to uh, Rabbi Rothwein. 
Yeah, um, all excellent points. Listen, I, I would just say only in, in, in the interest of time, I mean, because we're, we're almost out of time, um, I, you know, we, we really can't go through the entire, you know, spectrum of, of, of Jewish ritual life and experience. I will just say as a general comment, um, there, there's, there, in every area of, of, of halacha and, and Jewish living experience, there's always a tendency to focus on the wrong things and to um, exaggerate how important one thing is at the expense of another. We see that again and again. Again, this is not a new problem. The prophets speak about this all the time. The fact that we sort of, we, we got it all wrong. We're focusing on the wrong things. We're focusing on the externals, etc. So this is just one feature of, of a problem that we have in general. And that is that we go through the motions and we do things because that's the way we've always seen them done. And sometimes we just don't know that something's a question. We don't, we're embarrassed to ask a question. We don't know the difference between, you know, a, as I mentioned beforehand, a law um, and, uh, you know, a halacha, an obligation, and a custom. Um, as I already alluded to, but I'm just going to say right now, there is no situation where a person who either themselves or is concerned about others as, as, having, as being somewhat at risk is required to, have, to consume any alcohol whatsoever. Um, I, I can say that with, with, with full confidence. Um, it is true that in a situation where there is no risk, there sometimes is a preference to use alcohol. I will tell you that my Rebbe, Rebbe Willig, you know, uses grape juice, for Havdalah. Why? Not because he has any problem with, with consuming alcohol, because in, in his permiss in his opinion, we're not going to get into the sugi, so to speak, right now, um, at, for Havdalah, there really is no preference to use wine over a grape juice. And so therefore, his default position is, if I don't, so to speak, have to have wine, I'm not going to have wine. It's, it's very interesting. You know, I, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's an attitude that one takes, and maybe that's partially, I mean, I'm sure it's to a large extent due to the fact that he has been a lightning rod for so many, God forbid, some of the, the terrible, life-threatening um, situations and questions and challenges that people have to deal with. He knows what's out there. So again, it's not just that he's personally been sort of beaten into submission and is afraid to touch alcohol, but, you know, as, as, as a leader, to say, you know what, we, we don't, we, we rarely, if ever, actually have to include alcohol in our rituals and when we do it could be done you know in a very very scaled back way there is never an obligation to get drunk ever under any circumstances whatsoever um and you know that's something that you know we need to be uh, mindful of i don't know who i'm speaking to right now i mean as i you know i recognize some of the faces and i don't recognize any of the names which is fine but if anything i'm saying to you strikes you as being odd or or maybe you know um i don't know heretical feel free to you know, reach out to me. I'm happy to, to discuss it with you further and side chapter and verse. But I, I think we need to be confident, very, very confident as Jews, as, as observant Jews and as knowledgeable Jews that the halacha never makes the, make any demands of us which jeopardize our health. Um, and, 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 if, and if there's ever a perception of a conflict, it's because we don't understand uh, the halacha um, and we need to become more informed so we can, you know, navigate our way through these um, challenging situations, um, as both Arnie and Sachi mentioned, in a way that highlights um, the, the, the spiritual parts of these rituals, ultimately that which is most important, but certainly never to put anybody uh, at, 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 at any risk. I think with that, I'm afraid we need to wrap up. We're uh, pretty much out of time. I want to thank... Uh, Rabbi Rothwax, Arnie, uh, Dr. Rossman, um, for your time and your insight this morning. It was really terrific. Thank you to all who joined. Just a quick reminder that the recordings will be available on the CCSA website. I popped up the uh, URL in the chat for you, just in case you don't recall. And thank you very much. And we hope maybe next time we get together, we'll have more success stories as we all get more educated and strive to do better to help everyone, ourselves and everyone around us. Thank you very much, everybody.